So we are really excited about this work. And uh, now we're moving toward different ways in which we can translate some of the concepts I talked to you about before. And I'd like to use this as an opportunity to introduce Ken Mandel, uh, an MD, PhD, uh, who has actually co-founded Layer Bio. And uh, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of a description of his background, and then we'll have a chance to, to talk a little bit further. Uh, now, Ken is an ophthalmologist by training. Um, uh, but he also has a huge amount of expertise in early stage development of innovations. And you can see some of these listed here, all of them involving drug delivery for both topical and injectable applications. Uh, right now, he's the acting VP of medical affairs uh, for Aldira. Uh, he's an advisor to Oculive, and uh, he's also an advisor uh, and, uh, to the Harvard University Department of Ophthalmology. Uh, now, you're going to hear a little bit more about Ken's background. He's been an extremely exciting person to work with in the formation of Layer Bio. So what we're going to do is move to our fireside chat. So you can imagine the flames rising up behind us as, <laughs> as we move to our seating arrangement. All Thank right. you, Paula. Thanks. Now, Ken, uh, first, could you uh, just give us a little bit of background about Layer Bio? And tell us a little bit of the story of how it was founded. Sure. So um, uh, the, we founded the company in 2013, but I first started working with you um, towards the end of my residency because I was interested in coding intraocular lenses with drug for cataract surgery. And so that was my first interaction with the technology. Um, we uh, applied for a grant from the Despande Center, and so they funded some pre-spin-out work for us. Um, and then we did an iTeams course with the Sloan Business School, and they helped us identify um, specific uh, markets or potential applications for what we we're going to work on. And then we formed the company in 2013. Excellent. Could you tell us what the company focuses on? I'd like to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, we are not focusing on everything that Paula presented. Paula presented a large body of scientific work. Um, layer by layer, drug delivery is a large platform. Um, we're focused mostly on ophthalmology, wound care, and some orthopedic and biosurgical applications but not as focused on um, systemic delivery for cancer or the nanoparticle part. Excellent. Now, how did Layer Bio decide what parts of my work were appropriate for commercialization right now? So it, it was a process that began, as I said, with um, an academic process with the, the iTeams course and kind of taking a top-down approach, looking at different markets and interviewing people. Um, but I think the real work began when we formed the company and then started talking to potential partners and investors. And we wanted to understand where the need for this platform was and what specific areas and also what limitations there might be. Um, you know, one thing to be aware of is it's not just what you can show in, a, in an in vivo experiment in a mouse, but to actually create a product, you have to think about uh, manufacturing and the cost of goods. You have to think about scaling up your manufacturing process, about um, regulatory requirements for the polymers that you're going to use or the drugs that you're going to incorporate with the polymers, um, and also just where your own core expertise was. And my, my expertise was something that more people honed in on than I expected. And they said, well, you're an ophthalmologist and you have some experience with dermatology and topical drug delivery. And so I think that, along with some of the other constraints, kind of guided the direction we went in for the, for the products we're developing. Yeah, so I think very exciting uh, top first choices, though. Yeah. Can you tell us um, a little bit about uh, the people, the key people in Layer Bio, and how that whole process of getting the company started, you know? Sure. So, I, I mean, I think we're fortunate because there's a lot of people um, in this area and the MIT community who have expertise that's relevant to what we're working on and finding people to work in our company. Um, I, I don't think it's easy necessarily to find somebody who's ready to just jump into a startup, leave the security or the stability of a large company or of academia. Um, but I, I was lucky because I found a few so far. Um, one person, my co-founder, Alex White, um, he actually worked on layer by layer 
coatings as part of his master's um, in, the, in the lab of Paula's mentor here at MIT, Mike Rubner's lab. And so you know, more than 15 years ago, he had de developed his own experience with, with layer by layer. And it just happened through my dentist, I guess. I was introduced to Alex. He said, oh, you're doing something in biotech? You should meet Alex. He wants to do something in biotech. But it turned out that Alex was a great fit technically. He also happened to be my, my uh, neighbor. And so and it's been a love affair ever since. We've been very, very happy together. Um, and and um, you know, somebody else who joined the companies in the audience, uh, Brian, was somebody who came to us with an engineering background. Um, and we found him through uh, the Mass Life Science Center because they have an intern database. And it was a bunch of, of uh, students uh, you know, interested in finding internship opportunities. And he's worked with us um, now full time for over a year now. Um, and then Karen's in the audience too. And, and Karen's somebody who had a, a background in molecular biology, um, but also worked with the Despande Center and has been at the MIT Media Lab for a while. And so she brings a whole different skill set to the company. So th there's been a number of people locally um, who, who just seem to have the right background and were interested in joining us at this early stage. It's very, very, very fortunate to have those connections. Now, what is Layer Bios funding right now? And it's funding and resource strategy in general. Yeah, so something I, I told Paula that I wanted to talk about, particularly for early stage companies, is, um, you know, I, I, I made, so far I've made a choice to find a lot of non-dilutive capital, and I've also found access to resources or services um, with, with either deferred sort of payment or some sort of creative financing. Um, and, and I think that's something that no one will tell you how to do. You never know where those resources are until you start looking for them. Um, but we have, um, just to kind of lay things out, so we have received two SBIR grants, one from the National Science Foundation, one from the NIH. Um, we received a grant from um, the Massachusetts Life Science Center, which was a very um, good grant to have to help us. Uh, we have some friends and family um, investors, so we have some convertible debt. And then um, we have uh, three funded partnerships with um, either small, medium, and large pharmaceutical companies in, in this area, um, each working on a different project with a different type of drug for a different application. Uh, but the part about resources where I think there's some creativity, you know, is that we, we found um, a MedChem incubator uh, in, in Woburn called Creogen, and Creogen used to be a very large medicinal chemistry contract research organization, but just through changes in our economy and outsourcing and other things, they realized that um, there was less demand for their services, but there was a huge demand for lab space, particularly ready-to-use lab space. And so we were one of their first tenants. Um, SQZ Biotech was another one, um, that, and they've been extremely successful since then. Uh, so we found affordable lab space, um, and we found a, a very nice arrangement with um, Wilmer Hale, which is a very large law firm that offers um, deferred payment for legal services to early stage companies, and they've worked with a lot of MIT companies. So I'm advertising a little bit, but honestly, I, w I wouldn't be where I am right now without um, support from some of those companies. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, thank you. So now I get to ask you some questions. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so one of the questions I wanted to ask Paula was what were you expecting and what weren't you expecting about starting a company? And just kind of tell me what it was like from your side as the, the inventor. Sure. I think it's really an exciting opportunity when uh, there's a chance to translate your, the things that you've always been trying to actualize into a real company. But it's also a scary venture. I was very fortunate because Ken was there to really absorb all of the risk, which I always appreciate, and, and do all of the, the huge amount of groundwork. I think uh, it's, it's, it would not have been possible without having someone who's, who's there to hold the, uh, the torch and move the company forward. And that's, that is the key component. There has to be the catalyst. Um, on top of that, though, uh, there are some interesting experiences in doing this work because, as you saw, there are several different areas that we're working in. 
And uh, in my mind, I want to see translation of each one of those areas. Um, however, if I were to have guessed which area would be translated first, um, I definitely had some surprises because we had a huge amount of data in uh, small and medium-sized animals for our bone work. So I thought, well, this will probably be the area that translates first, right? It got all of this data. Um, and uh, we've been talking with um, orthopedic surgeons and we've been engaging. However, um, what turned out to be much more real, much closer to translation, was the ophthalmological work that we started. This is how Ken and I actually got enge became engaged with each other, was uh, a kind of, um, uh, my, my graduate student had met uh, a, a cohort of Ken's uh, an idea got stirred up about uh, coding intraocular lenses. She had a main project, so this was her other project. She started working with Ken on this. Ken really had an idea of let's let's see if we can let's see if we can do this. And uh, we actually, you know, we we did the work of releasing an anti-inflammatory drug in con controlled fashion. Well, this project, which which had uh, the smallest amount of preliminaries and previous work was the one that really took off in terms of being able to build um, one of the key bases of what Lear Bio does now. And they've been able to move this forward in a, a beautiful fashion. Um, but you wouldn't, you would, if you think that it is the most established element in your lab that is going to be the most readily translated, that's definitely uh, something that is not necessarily true. It turns out that it's that combination that Kim was describing of, of opportunity, expertise, and the right platform at the right time for a need. And, and I think this was really all of those things coming together, uh, combined with the fact that uh, there were uh, partners who were showing interest and uh, perhaps giving us those signs of interest. Um, so that's, that's part of it, is that surprise factor of um, what's going to happen first. And I, I think another sort of interesting aspect is understanding uh, how to bring your product to the level that it is approachable, understandable, and translatable to others. And I'm learning that, I think that the ophthalmological example was a great experience for me because it allowed me to be able to think about what we do in a, in a fashion that allows me to think of the simplest product as well as the more complex things that we can do. The professor part, the academic part, will always look at the more complex things as the systems that are going to drive those big papers. But uh, the part that wants to see the translation is thinking about how we can uh, look at this as uh, perhaps we don't need something that is going to completely give us bone regeneration at first. Perhaps we simply want to uh, solidify the joint, you know, in the, you know, improve the integration. Perhaps we want to make this improvement and then move on. And so I think that's, that's another aspect. There are areas where um, I think cancer is an area where you can shoot a little higher because of the risk and uh, the urgency of the disease. But it, on, on a broader level in the biomedical field, one has to understand the role of differing levels of complexities and know when to plug those in. And I'm learning a lot about that in this process. So. Um Another question I was going to ask you had to do with just discussing um, different sources of funding and how it enables you to do different things in your lab. One source of funding being federal grants, another source being like large pharmaceutical companies that sponsor research, and then the third being uh, creating a spin-off of your own to, as a vehicle for, for innovation and advancing the technology. Oh, yeah, that, a really great question because uh, from the perspective of a researcher, an innovator in a lab like um, the ones we have here at, at MIT, you have these different sources of funding and they all serve different purposes. The federal grants are really uh, the ones that enable you perhaps to go the furthest in terms of different areas of innovation. Uh, you need to have those seed ideas. You need something uh, to begin with. And often those beginnings happen when you have a grant that gives you more room to, to um, essentially generate and create the technologies that are going to allow you to do what you do later. 
So there's a very key, a really critical role uh, in uh, usually the first grants that uh, a faculty member or a research scientist gets is, is from a federal source and allows them to do a little bit more. There's more room for that kind of innovation. That said, a number of the innovations that we've generated have come from two different spaces. Um, and on the one hand, we've been approached by large companies that say, we see what you're doing, and we think that would be ideal to use for X, Y, Z. And the amount of engineering and innovation that goes around thinking about this new problem in this new space spares a different level of innovation, because now you have to think about how to meet that challenge. It changes your design parameters, and you become very much uh, the targeted engineer uh, looking at how you can design a system that can address these needs. In doing so, you also put your foot and the feet of the members of your lab closer to translation, and they get to see that process. If it's a good collaborative interaction, then that can be a wonderful thing. Now, a spin-off is an entirely different thing. It's sort of uh, taking your heart, you know. It's the, it's, it's, uh, uh, a company, it, companies are wonderful partners. Um, but of course, it's a partnership, and it means that you're trying to meet each other's needs uh, to get the greater good. But a company is about uh, believing in the technology that has been generated in your lab, which is that heart, and uh, committing to it and actually evolving it into a product. And there you have this uh, combination of requiring the, um, the pragmatism to know that there are specific areas of application that you need to address and determining them, but you also need that innovative space so that you can adapt and change toward the area or the goal that you're reaching for. So it's really an interesting world, and I think it, it's a world that enables spontaneity and engagement of, uh, of exciting scientific uh, people across the board. I'm just checking to see if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, really scientifically very fascinating story as well as you know being able to spin off that heart out of your lab and hopefully you know great success coming up. Uh, lots of questions to be asked but the two sort of you know respecting the time that comes to my mind. What was some of the internal factors sort of you know made you maybe uh, thought about uh, think about spinning out this you know company uh, and what could um, I'm from G Ventures, so what could sort of you know corporations do, other than maybe the you know cashing in, you know how could we help to maybe catalyze some of these type of you know um, innovations uh, coming to commercialization? We want to start with the top and I took the bottom. Or? Yeah. So the the first question, like what was sort of the impetus for actually crossing over to to spinning it out? I think one was. Um, we had talked about it. We talked about it multiple times. Um, going through the iTeams course gave us a little bit of an idea about how to do it. But eventually, it was, it was mostly my availability. I just reached a point where I was ready, and I said, I have time to you know, kind of take hold of it for a while to do that. And then your, your, se your second question was, what can companies, companies do to? That, that's a really good question because, I mean, there, there's few things that move forward without a champion. And, and if um, you said torch, but most people say rock. You know, it's like a large boulder that you're pushing uphill. And, um, and, and so I think that, you know, it's really hard to nominate somebody, but frequently it, it, it's not always the, the PI or senior person. Sometimes it, it, it's, um, you know, a med student or just somebody who's there for their masters or something, and they say, you know, this is something I think that we can pursue further, and they, they take it forward. So I think it is, it is about finding the right people at the right time. And then I think the second thing that's important for translation is having capital available and lab space and other things like that. And, 
you know, just to compare and contrast, I think that there are some universities and cities that have very structured incubator programs and tax incentives, and maybe even the university will take equity in a company um, in return for allowing them to continue to do research in their actual lab. I think University of Utah has a model like that, and they've had success spinning out a lot of companies, particularly high tech. Um, but I think MIT leaves things to sort of the natural ecosystem. And so I, I think here, most things happen bottom up just because people are interested in it. One thing, oh, very briefly, uh, on top of uh, Ken's comment, I was just going to mention that some large companies have begun incubator programs or spin outs that are venture oriented. And I think that those things can be good things if they, if they can provide more avenues in which uh, translation can occur. I think uh, right now, what may be needed is, is uh, a looser leash on those kinds of ventures. In other words, sometimes they have requirements. They have to tie into the home company's base. I think that, that can be highly constraining. So I, I, if, if companies do these kinds of uh, venture arrangements, um, which are valuable and add a huge amount, I think that they will be able to net an even larger impact if they're able to release their venture efforts uh, from their own uh, current uh, researcher area. And to ask how one can structure innovation, it's almost an oxymoron. I mean, because a lot of inno innovation is, does not follow rules. It, it, it's yeah. you know, just exploratory by nature. So I think that's the, the challenge, is to, to try to do that top down can be very challenging. Last question from Berlin. Uh, I have a question for you, and I, I really uh, like to comment on the remark that you made of partnering with Big Pharma while you are developing your product versus spinning out. So there are two different venues, I guess. I mean, you want to bring your product to a patient and uh, because you have you know, a goal, you want to benefit society. Um, and I would like to maybe get a little bit more of, of, of your thoughts around these two different options. I mean, I do work at Pfizer, Big Pharma. I think Big Pharma brings drug development expertise very unique, that is very well needed. And when you sometimes do it on your own, you miss on that expertise, on that guidance that maybe the drug developers can provide you. And maybe you can go faster and even with higher quality than if you try to do it on your own. Uh, some people have to have tackled this problem by sitting on their boards, um, corporate venture individuals. So I, I want to get your thoughts on, on, on this matter and, and what your preferences are. Sure, because I, I also have been funded by uh, large pharmaceutical companies. And I, I think, there, again, there are pros and cons. Uh, with a, a pharmaceutical company, you can get a huge amount of leverage in getting something started. But because companies do tend to change their own uh, internal directions uh, fairly rapidly, it's, it can be difficult to ensure that the product idea and concept is able to go from beginning to end. In some cases, it does. But in some cases, uh, the company has decided that they're not working in this area, perhaps, or that they want to lean in a different way. So the pros are that you get to develop and evolve a product and get it to a point where it could be very interesting even if perhaps it's not that same company. Uh, but the cons are that you, you may lose the partner simply because of the evolution of that partner. With a startup, you're sort of in that committed space. I think one of the newest, or what, one of the models that has worked extremely well is when a startup is, is sprung uh, from the innovators themselves, and then um, that company, or spin out, uh, begins to partner with large pharma. Somehow that seems to enable the injection of expertise at the right point of development when uh, there's a successful partnership between the small uh, companies that are doing innovation and large pharma that uh, when they see the opportunity are able to sort of invest in that partnership. Yeah, I, I think that in, in the current situation with the three partners we have, we have, I think to your point, the expertise that we need from their side and the depth of capabilities, but we also have a little bit more freedom. And they would admit, admit to us that, that we have more freedom to, to innovate in that environment. So I, I think that that balance has been really helpful to us. Oh, very quickly, Regina. Uh, yeah. 
That was a very nice talk on the multi-layered. I had a question, and it's a very simple question, because you were talking about in terms of the layers being positive and negative charge and, and that the pH may affect it in terms as well. And since m a lot of the drugs have different properties, I was wondering if that affects the sequence that whether you can put the drug on in terms of those types of layers, if the sequence, if it restricts you in terms of sequence, and if you want the three layers to be the same drug, whether any of the properties of the negative positive charge as well as the pH is gonna affect that. Yes, uh, short, short answer is yes to all of those. And what we have done is engineer systems so that we address each concern with each um, uh, sort of drug type. Uh, once we understand how a certain drug molecule, let's say hydrophobic, uncharged, uh, small charged, how it layers with some of our polymeric materials, we generate a tool, a set of uh, material systems that tend to work with them. And once we understand what conditions they can be assembled at, we can then vary what goes on top and what goes on bottom. But we, the work that we do does include optimizing those kinds of conditions so that we can have that flexibility. Thank you. Sure. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Paula and Ken.